Um, I had an extraordinary experience the other day. I went back to my alma mater and um, we were doing a conference on the future of China and a fellow by the name of um, Kevin Rudd. Everybody know who he is? He used to be Prime Minister of um, Australia and, and um, Lu Kowen is his Chinese name and he gave a talk to this audience. Everyone spoke Chinese in the audience. It was mostly Chinese students and some scholars. And he gave the talk in Chinese and in English. So he was his own translator. It was remarkable. And as I listened to the, to the conversation, I actually, there was something that almost, I began to think about, he has a day job. He was prime minister of Australia, but he speaks perfect Chinese. And I kept thinking to myself, <laughs> So for those of you who don't speak Chinese, is will there be an American president one day who speaks such fluent Chinese? And it would be, in a, in a lot of ways, that's, that's part of what I want to talk about today. What do you think the most common question that I'm asked in my life is? What do you think it is? Any, anybody looked at my biography? Anybody, any hands up? It's obvious. Mm -hmm. Right? Isn't that what everybody would ask? Why in 1970 did you start studying Chinese? And it's a story in a lot of ways that's going to relate to those of you who remain in the United States. It may relate to kind of your lives the way it related to my lives, because, you know, I'm a, mostly a first-generation American. You know, my, pa my mother's family had come from France. My father's parents had come from Russia. They'd escaped governments that were going to take their lives. So they, I grew up in a household where they said to us, you know, but for the American people, but for the American government, you don't exist. Your brother, your sister, and you, you don't exist. So you owe the American government this debt of gratitude. You need to, you know, if, if it were the Cultural Revolution, they would say, you know, you should be serving the people or the, or the, um, or the government. So I grew up believing I was going to go to West Point, but something interfered, which was called the war in Vietnam. So I became progressively more involved in fighting against our government, fighting against the policies of the American government. And then, you guys know what a senior, what senior slump is? You know, it's kind of in China, it's after you took the gao call and you know where you're going to go to college, you kind of take it easy till you go to college. So in my case, I knew where I was going to go to college, so I went to work for a, uh, the senator from my state who was running for president, a fellow whose name was Robert F. Kennedy, the, the, the younger brother of the, you know, our assassinated president. And you know, I was just a kid. When I say I went, to, I passed out leaflets. That was my job. I stood on street corners and passed out leaflets for him. And, and um, so one morning I go, to, you know, I hear the radio and I go down to my parents, you know, sobbing, unable to speak, just sobbing, because I'd heard the news that Robert Kennedy had been assassinated in California. And I was the first one up. My parents thought my sister or my brother or, or someone was dead, but not in our family, because I was so upset, couldn't speak. And my parents then said, you know, in, in our belief, we you know, we believe you live on through your good works and kind of through your children. That's kind of the way in our family you, you, you live on. That's where your immortality is. So they convinced me to put up in my room this little, you know, these words which Kennedy used to use quoting George Bernard Shaw, which was, some see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. So I put that up in the room 
And in many ways, when I think about U.S.-China relations, and I think about when the relationship is, is good and when it's bad, it's when our leaders dream things that never were and ask why not the relationship does well. And when they don't, it does badly. So we've had all these different periods. Oh, by the way, the, the end of, the, of that particular story was in 1970. On, on April 30th, President Nixon announced the invasion of Cambodia, which created an eruption on campuses throughout the United States. And at Harvard, school was closed. For the first time, I believe for the first time in history, school was actually closed. And I went to a very august professor and I said, I'm going to study Vietnamese to understand why good people, the American government, do bad things, the war in Vietnam. And he was this august professor. He says, ah, you learn all about, learn all about Asia by studying Chinese. And I'll get you a fellowship to do it. And that was the length of the conversation which changed my whole life. 45 seconds. And that was it. So I started studying Chinese and, and uh, the rest is history. But when you, when you look at it, so if you think back, Jan tomorrow, Jan Barris tomorrow, will talk about the history of the National Committee, which Carla has chaired now for more than a decade. But the vision of the people who set that up, and you know, Mike Lampton, of course, Professor Lampton was also one of my predecessors as president of the committee. But the vision that they had, 1966, what's going on in China? What's going on in China? The Cultural Revolution. What's going on in the United States? The war in Vietnam. We refer to you know Red China as the bandits. You know it's it's there is no contact whatsoever. But our founders had the vision that we needed a place in the United States where we could have free and open discussions of China. And they really had that great vision. So then when President Nixon and Secretary Kissinger and Mao and Joe had this vision that we could break this then 23-year isolation. It was visionary, and they did it. And it was so extraordinarily successful because they didn't worry. They didn't. They worried about it, but they didn't cave in to the domestic for political forces which were in opposition to what they were seeking to accomplish. And if you get the opportunity, now the interaction begins. Murray's not here, is he, Jake? The Date is January 16th, 1979. January 16th, 1979. How's it? What's the amount? Uh, $12.00. $12.00. And, zero cents. Twelve and, zero cents. and mm -hmm. who is it payable to? Uh, DC Treasurer. And <laughs> what does it say for the reason I wrote the check? Maybe that's very small print. Uh, I only can read a few words because it is not so clear. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something, something of American Institute in Taiwan. It says incorporation of the American Institute in Taiwan. Now, why does that sit on the most prominent place on my mantelpiece in the office? Anybody, can anybody guess why that would be important? And think about the theme, dream things that never were, and ask why not. Anybody guess what that was? Carla said in my biography what I did. Give you a hint. <laughs> Over here. Because you guys never heard about uh, diplomatic relations with China. That's right. We, were we had established diplomatic relations with China. 
15 days before, and the president had decided that we needed to continue unofficial relations with the people on Taiwan. So what he did, even though there was no precedent, it was not something that had ever been done, he said we would create this not-for-profit corporation called the American Institute in Taiwan to continue these relations with Taiwan. Because if we didn't continue these relations with Taiwan, the American people would not have, have accepted the establishment of diplomatic relations with China. So President Carter kind of saw, he dreamed things that never were. And he asked, why can't we do this? And we did something which had never been done, and it has been a remarkable, an extraordinary success. So I leave it up there so I can look at it every day and remember that you can do stuff if you have the vision. After we did that, there wasn't much left to do at the State Department, so I went and I moved to Beijing. And I still, you know, and it was, you know, Gaiga Kaifang had just begun. You guys are all, probably, there are only a few people who were born then. This was October 19, 1979. And Deng Xiaoping had just announced the, the beginning of reform and opening. And the vision, everybody was fearful, but the vision that he was able to convey to both the Chinese people in the world allowed for this extraordinary success. The most incredible part was, I still remember, I go to Shenzhen very frequently. I went to Shenzhen, which was just the first special economic zone, and I stood there, and it was just rice paddies. It was just rice paddies, and there was a little city, kind of a village, a fishing village there, and there was not much. And they showed me these plans. And I was 29 years old, and I said, <laughs> and Not easy, but they did it. They did it through the vision. And it was extraordinary success. And what that did, what these economic reforms did, is ultimately brought the United States and China so much closer together. And if you think, if I think to the kind of the groundwork that Carla Hill has laid in terms of starting to talk to the Chinese about WTO accession and the vision that Zhu Rongji and Jiang Zemin had about using WTO accession for major reform of the Chinese economy. Again, an example of where the vision prevailed, where they dreamed things. If you had said to me in 1979 that China would become a participant in the WTO, you would have laughed. It's not possible. But there, they did it. But then you have times when the vision fails, when they change domestic forces and other forces overwhelm the vision. And in a couple of weeks, I guess next week, we'll have the 25th anniversary of June 4th, which was an example of when U.S.-China relations were ruptured severely because of a lack of vision, because no one could see that there were other ways to incorporate this into Chinese society. And when I walked among the students, many of whom were your age, when I walked in Tiananmen, on those days among the students and spoke with them, one wondered if there was some other way, but it failed and ruptured the relationship. And then I think of Li Dunhui's visit to the United States. In what it, it sounds simple to most American politicians. We have some Cornell graduates here? Some folks in Cornell? We got one Cornell. He's a graduate of Cornell. So he was invited to his alumni reunion. In guy male India. Right? Except the United States government had committed that officials from Taiwan would not visit 
So rather than have, again, the vision and the strength to do the right thing and say, sorry, you can't visit, we made a bad decision which lacked vision and ruptured the relationship. So it happens on both sides. And I think the question today, as we approach the first anniversary of the C. Obama visit and discussions in Sunnyland, is will we look back at that as something, you know, the Xin Xin Da Guo Guanxi, the new big power relationship? Will we look at that as something which has laid the foundation for great strides, or was it just the beginning of what has become a downturn in the relationship? Because when you look at the discussions in the United States today about China, and you look at the discussions in China about the United States, it's filled with mutual distrust. You know, we had in our president, we, most of you were here during our presidential campaign, and they had ads about China which were as negative as you could possibly create, where they had a professor addressing students in a room somewhat like this, in Mandarin, quite good Mandarin as a, as a matter of fact. And he talks about the decline and fall of the American empire. And if you elect so-and-so, that is what is going to happen. So using China as a threat. And that just kind of, to me, summarized the views, the discussion, the political discussion that we have about China today. What's happened since then is if you look in the newspapers, whether it's the Diao Yudao, the Nansha, the Xi Sha, the, the, the indictment of five PLA officers for hacking into US companies' computers and using that for commercial advantage. We saw the president, even in today's speech, talk about standing with our allies against violations of international law in the South China Sea. And I read that and I say, it's interesting. It's not clear to me which side is violating international law. And that should have been the president's statement. Otherwise, it was a great speech. <laughs> when I go to China, I, here's a question. How many of you believe, how many of you are aware, I should ask, this is a very young crowd, how many of you are aware of the US bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade? Put up your hand. That's all. I guess these are not foreign policy meetings. <laughs> the, the, how many of you believe it was deliberate? That the United States did it on purpose. How many of you believe the American explanation that it was a, an accident? Oh, it's more than usual. No, foreigners don't get to vote. <laughs> but the, when I ask that in China, 100% say it was intentional by the United States. When the, the perception in China that American policy is seeking to either contain or restrain China is widely, widely held. I can remember when I was doing a, um, and this is why the foreign policy colloquium is important, I was doing a CCTV interactive show and there were 50 people in the audience and they got to ask questions. And some of them asked questions, which I answered, and some gave speeches. And one of the speeches was Chi U.S. policy on Chinese currency valuation is simply an attempt to stifle China's economic growth, that there is no rationale to it. And the audience, the other 49 people, all applauded. <laughs> the mistrust needs to be dealt with. And that, in a way, is a lot of what the foreign policy colloquium is about. So you can learn 
kind of what it is that goes into our making of foreign policy. Because the real issues, when you look at the issues that kind of pervade the US-China relationship, they're actually not core. One of the great things, and you're all invited to come see, you can pass the check around, by the way. You can come, that's not the original, so you can pass it around. The original sits in my office, and when I'm no longer here, it will go to a museum, whichever museum wants it. The, um, but one of the great things about our office, when you go there, is it looks out at lower New York. That this unobstructed view of Wall Street, the Statue of Liberty, it's this wonderful, wonderful view. And it's also wonderful because it's a constant reminder to me of what the real issues that the United States confronts. Because what do we look at? The first thing I see when I look out my window is the new construction of Freedom Tower. Everybody know what Freedom Tower is? It's You guys know what it is? What is it replacing? World Trade Center. So it's a reminder that terrorism is an enormous threat to America. I look at Wall Street, which is a reminder that just a few years ago, six years ago, the economic and financial crisis almost brought down both America and China. China did better, but it certainly was a threat to America's future. And finally, I look at the Hudson River. And why do you think the Hudson River reminds me of what the critical issue facing America is. Any idea? Anybody, anybody, NYU, Columbia, CCNY? No? No New Yorkers here? NYIT? What school? Columbia. Columbia. What happened to the Hudson River a couple of years ago? Yeah, during Hurricane Sandy, it flooded for the, you know, for the first, in a hundred years, this hadn't happened. And what it, it actually destroyed the building in which I was living. Since I was living, I used to say I lived on the Hudson, then I said I lived in the Hudson. So it became, it reminds us that climate change, is the real serious threat. The head of our Pacific forces who focuses on security, when he was interviewed, when he was up at Harvard and interviewed by the Boston Globe, he answered honestly when asked, what is the greatest threat to American security in the Pacific? And he says the changes wrought by climate change because that is going to fundamentally undermine so many of the countries in the Asia Pacific. So if those are the real threats, not the political threats, the ones that get made up for kind of domestic political reasons, what, what should we be doing? What does it mean for all of us? Because when I see all of these things, all of the changes, that seem to be going on, I go back and I say, but these are not the core of the relationship. Are the disagreements in the South China Sea with the Philippines and Vietnam and the disagreements with Japan where it appears that the United States and China are standing on opposite sides, are the differences over the Diaoyudao, the Sinkakus, something which is fundamental or is it on the margins, and I would argue that it's on the margins, and that the core threats, the core threats to China and the United States are actually shared threats, and we need to start thinking about it. So I think about the relationship, and so many of the things over these 35 years have remained static, but there are two things that have changed enormously in the last few years. One of them, and this one I feel very strongly because my first job after I left the State Department was 
representing U.S. investors in China. And I believe that through that work, through dealing with Chinese throughout China, I created, not that wasn't my purpose, but I inadvertently created a constituency that strongly supports constructive U.S.-China relations. So the change that has occurred, that is occurring as we speak now, is last year China invested $16 billion into the United States, much more than the United States invested into China. So what is going to happen? One of the changes that is going to occur is that the way I changed people and others like me, it wasn't me alone, there were hundreds, thousands of Americans who were making those investments, that they created this constituency in favor of constructive U.S.-China relations. The same will now happen with Chinese investment in the United States. The other enormous change is you. It's you. There are 235,000 Chinese college and graduate students now studying in the United States. And I can only believe that you are going to become the foundation for the stronger U.S.-China relationship. It just defies logic that this won't work. Some of you are going to stay. Some of you are going to stay and become part of American society and you're going to work here and you're going to have families here. And maybe your kids will be like me believe that you have been granted, you will teach your kids that you have been granted this extraordinary privilege to have studied best universities in China and now studying at the best universities in the world and contributing to society. And you will teach your children that they owe society an obligation for having benefited from that privilege, the privileges that you have been given. Bill Gates, when he spoke at Harvard's graduation, closed by saying, to, tho to those whom much is given, much is expected. As I just said, you've gone to the finest universities in China. You've come to the finest universities in America. You've received educations that when I first went to China, no one could have dreamed of. And in benefiting from those privileges, you have taken on the obligation that Bill Gates talks about. And what I'd ask after the foreign policy colloquium is that when things come up in the U.S.-China relationship and you know it's inaccurate, you know it's wrong, you take on an obligation to actually speak up and say, no, that's not the way it is. And that's true if you're in America and it's true when you go back to China. Because if you do that, and if the hundreds of thousands of other Chinese students participate in that way, I am certain that Bing Tianhui Gong Hao. I'll take some questions. Now we've got a lot of experts here, so feel free to ask questions. Keep passing the check around. It's a piece of American history. Can't be this shot. Columbia. Uh, thank you, President uh, Orlis. It's, it's 
Thank you for your wonderful speech. So you mentioned about the vision a lot in your speech. So my question is, that every Chinese leadership has their vision and legacy. What do you think will be the expected vision by the American people for the current Chinese leadership? That's my question. The vision of the American people for the Chinese leadership? Yes, like, I, I, I don't think the American people have a vision of the Chinese leadership. <laughs> no, I don't think they. I, I think it's not on the radar screen. American people care about what happens within America. I think that's both a strength and a weakness. Um, you know, America. Now, what Steve Sistanovich would have been talking about, if and what I hope he'll talk about tomorrow is America is in a period of retrenchment that because of the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan that we're in a period where foreign involvement is not something which we're seeking and President Obama gave a speech today at West Point which talked about that um, but most Americans you know when you poll Americans views of China the misunderstanding I believe Mike this is true that they, people believe, Americans believe China's economy is already bigger than the United States. Of course, it's not half the size, unless if you're using... It's the world's leading economic power. Right, world's leading economic power. So I, I think there's little, there's little vision, which, which is why it's so important that when there are inaccuracies, that people speak out, because it's, it's very... Um, um, unformed. Over here. Um, thank you, Adam Liu from Stanford. Um, one of the questions I had when you were uh, giving this talk was this question about how will the United States ensure uh, striking a balance between honoring its commitment to regional allies such as Japan, South Korea, and probably Taiwan? Why, at the same time, ensuring the Chinese government that the presence of the American military in the region is not a threat? How, how to do that? Can you please tell us who you are, what school you're Oh, uh, Adam, Liu from, Adam Liu from Stanford University studying political science. And that's the tough, you know, that's the toughest question. You know, if you ask the White House today, you'll have the opportunity, um, when is Kin speaking? Friday, Friday morning. Uh, a representative from the State Department, you should ask that question and, and um, ask if he feels the balance has been struck. When you speak with the White House, they say the balance has been struck, that we're, you know, we're strengthening our alliances and we're reassuring the Chinese. Um, not, you know, I was in China during President Obama's trip um, to Asia and it was certainly not the perception of the Chinese media or the Chinese think tanks that they believe that you know, we have not done a good job of, of standing in the middle. But I would ask that of the administration. It's a good question. Um, I'm Wang Tao and from Cornell University. Uh, my question is regarding a tap in these days. I think, uh, as you've said, actually these days, I think the UA the relationship between China and the United States has confronted with some crisis. I mean, it's not a too big crisis, but it's uh, its only issue, I mean, a cyber attack. After, you know, the United States has uh, accused of the few Chinese people who who are suspected of attacking, uh, you know, the United States companies, so uh, Chinese government made some response and uh, the one big issue these days, I think a few guys, many of us have been talking about is the consulting companies uh, from the United States are kind of prohibited from providing service. All the state-owned companies of China are prohibited uh, using the service of the United States companies. So, I mean, how do you see this issue? I mean, um, what do you think of the possible response from the communi uh, business community? From the United States, and uh, from I mean from our community, from our community, how do you see the solution, possible solution for this issue? I mean, it's a really challenging issue, and uh, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. 
Well, I, I will answer briefly, and then um, we've got Hank Levine and David Finkelstein, one who's out of the U.S. Department of Commerce and one who's out of the U.S. military who are in the audience and can, and can add to that. But clearly, it's, it's been difficult, and the indictment, in my view, of the five PLA officers reflects the frustration with the lack of progress on this issue. That it's, you know, obviously China's not going to extradite these officers, so there's no expectation they will be brought to trial in the United States. So it's just an expression of frustration. We, the United States, have been raising it consistently, and my guess, I have no access to classified information since 1979, and this stuff didn't exist in 1979. Um, the, my guess is that the uh, level of kind of activity remain the same before and after our representations. But Hank, David, anything? You got a microphone for back here? Hank Levine he used to be both a consul general in Shanghai and, and uh, in the U.S. Hank's Department being, of Commerce. Being in the consulting business, actually, <laughs> currently, right. let me say, working yes, for that's an American right. consulting company. I guess I'd just say a couple of things. Number one, uh, you know, uh, the, the U.S. business community, I think Steve mentioned this, really has been a, a great pillar of support for U.S.-China relations. And, and therefore, an action like this, anything that, that, that sort of discourages the U.S. business community about access in the China market, uh, unfortunately, can, 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 can weaken the support of the business community for the overall U.S.-China relationship uh, to a certain point. Uh, still, companies overall, I think, are doing well in China, foreign companies, but this kind of action is unfortunate in that it does dampen the enthusiasm of some companies. Now, having said that, I don't know whether your particular concern and interest had to do with the job market uh, <laughs> for, uh, with it, but, but the fact is, of course, uh, you know, it turns out that the vast majority of the revenue generated by these consulting companies, the McKinsey's and so on, come from uh, foreign multinationals operating in China. I think the percentage that comes from Chinese state-owned companies is not uh, particularly large. So in pure economic terms, I'm not sure it's a huge uh, impact. But as I say, I think it sends an unhelpful signal it also underscores for Americans what one of the, the points that I think the U.S. business community is concerned about in general, and that is the very close relationship between Chinese companies and the Chinese government. And the sense that when foreign companies, U.S. companies are competing in China, often they're competing not against a pure commercial entity, but they're really competing against companies that are almost an arm of the government. And when the Chinese government says, well, we don't want foreign consulting companies working for state-owned enterprises because they may learn secrets from the state-owned enterprises. Well, that just highlights the fact, the close relationship between the Chinese companies and the Chinese government. And as I say, it's a, it's a general concern for the business community, and I think this action underscores that. David, anything you want to add? David Finkelstein, who's, who yeah. runs Hi, uh, something called know. CNA. Hi, I'm, I'm Dave uh, from the Center for Naval Analyses. You can call me Mao Fong. But uh, yeah, I, I think I would agree with President uh, Steve Orleans that the indictment was a symptom of tremendous frustration on the part of the administration that uh, attempts to talk about this very uh, difficult issue have not resulted in any action on anybody's part. So uh, we can only hope that uh, we weather this storm and, and move on. But. Uh, but from what I, I do understand uh, from talking to friends in government is that there is a tremendous and deep concern on the part of the administration about uh, being able to have American companies compete on a level playing field. Right? We say a level playing field where everybody is playing by the same rules and no one is disadvantaged uh, by assistance from other entities. Uh, and so uh, uh, we can only hope that we'll get past this, but it is a symptom of great frustration. Um, row two, and, oh, and then over here, and then another microphone here. Hi, uh, my name is Sudeva. I'm from American University Study Public Policy. So my question is, how can we make the Congress a more China-friendly place? Thank you. <laughs> well, there, there are two ways to do that. One is China can change some of the behavior which the Ch Congress objects to. 
that would make Congress much happier. The perception often in China is it's all generated by the Congress and it's kind of, it's, it's lacks fact. Well, a lot of what they do does lack fact, but then there's a lot that they do that's perfectly, that's perfectly sensible. So if, and some of the things they advocate um, actually are in the, you know, the 12th, you know, in the third plenum reforms. So there are a lot of things that actually may improve that. What we do to make, I wouldn't call it China friendly, it's not a term I would use, I would call it um, more strongly in favor of constructive U.S.-China relations. <laughs> People always say to me, oh, you're so China friendly. I said, no, I'm, I believe America's national interest is supported by constructive U.S.-China relations. I'm pro-America. So it's, 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 and that's what the co congressman is going to say also, that, that even though I lost my election, I still talk like I, I won. The, um, the other thing that we do is we bring a lot of congressmen and congressional staff to China. Um, last year, or in the last 12 months, we've taken 36 congressional staff members on trips to China and um, four congressmen. So four members and 36 staff. And I think when they see China um, live and in person and meet Chinese officials and meet people in the provinces, they walk away with a more nuanced view of what China is and what the relationship should be. So the National Committee spends an enormous amount of our time and money on, on those issues. Uh, but you know, as each country reforms, as China reforms, I think we don't, we in the United States don't have a good grasp of what the implications are for the third plenum reforms for the U.S.-China relationship. I think if you talk to most people, they kind of go, huh, what? What do you mean? You know, it just, as these kind of play out, and as American businesses who again, are very much in the service sector, um, have their businesses grow, it will improve the relationship, which is why Hank's point, if this is retaliation, retaliation, it's, it's, it's just not smart. It's not smart because you're punishing a group, McKinsey, how many, and we have anybody who have uh, employment offers from McKinsey, Bain, or BCG? Anybody? No, that's unusual. Usually there are a few McKinsey or Bain folks around. But um, to punish those companies who are actually very strong supporters of constructive U.S.-China relations and strong supporters of educating America about <coughs> China, to punish them is really counterproductive. So I, I'm not, um, I've only seen, I, is it confirmed that this has happened, by the way? It's a story in the Financial Times. Just a collection of the stories and no details either. But right. But I know people at those firms who work on SOE reform. And then, so you're, you're making a symbolic, the Chinese government is making a symbolic action. Because as Hank says, it's not a huge revenue source for these companies. They're punishing people who are pro-constructive relations and they're sending a message to America which is, which is kind of not one which I would particularly want to be sending at this time. There are a lot of other ways you could symbolically retaliate rather than that if that's what they, they want to do. So we had here. So, um, uh, and then Hi everyone, my name is uh, just kidding, yeah. My name is Tom Fang, so uh, I'm an uh, economics PhD student in uh, University of Hawaii. So oh, you've come from Hawaii? Yeah, from Hawaii. So how the Tianqi da Hawaii the Tianqi. So uh, I'm gonna go into ask you uh, ask the tough question. So I'm very glad that you. Uh, you know, brought up the climate change topic in this uh, colloquium. So, uh, actually, I just listened to uh, the former uh, Vice President Igor's 
a lecturer in uh, University of Hawaii. Al Gore? In, yeah, Al Gore. So he won the uh, Nobel Prize, you know, yeah, yeah. on the climate change. So um, actually, I'm very interested in the climate change. And uh, as you said, you know, the core threat to US and China is climate change. I think that you know, that's a very, uh, how to say, profound thought. So I also like found like there are more and more research on like climate change. And I just attend the, my friend's uh, dissertation defense in, in, I mean, in my university. So his uh, dissertation is uh, you know, uh, about the climate change in the business side. So since I study economics, I, I also have some professors um, start using like game theory to study like why you know how to make the the countries cooperate with each other to you know to deal with the climate change issue. Right, you're coming to a question, right? Um, <laughs> you know, so I'm not going to ask a question. So I, I just want you to talk more about climate change. So from your uh, point, yeah. You know, having experienced it, you know, it's something which we're not, you know, the situations in the two countries is quite different. When, uh, when we, we do programs with the Chinese where we talk about climate change, and there's no debate over the science. But when you're talking with Xie Jianhua or uh, another Chinese official on this, there's no discussion of the science. The science is accepted. In the United States, it's a politicized issue that the science is not generally, is, is, there are people who do not accept the science, which leads to decisions which may not really be helping to slow climate change. But the issue the Chinese are now dealing with, and I think if you live in Shanghai and on the coast is quite serious, is, is climate change is, you know, the reports, it is going to, affect China in a major way. It's already affecting China in a major way. And how are they going to adapt? And they're wrestling with that issue right now. I'll be in Shanghai in two weeks and we'll have a conference with some of the leading experts on climate change in China talking not only about slowing climate change because it no longer can be stopped. We've passed that point. But how to obviously try and slow it more rapidly but in addition, how are you going to adapt? Because the numbers in China, you know, you, you talk about, you know, these countries that may go underwater. Well, they, they're, don't want to minimize it, but they're hundreds of thousands of people. In China, you start talking about these cities starting to get flooded, and it's tens and hundreds of millions of people. And the relocation issue and the social disruption that will hit China is enormous and it's going to hit the United States too which is why you have the commander of the Pacific forces in the United States saying who sits in Hawaii you know saying that is the greatest threat to security and it is thank you uh, my name is Liang Zhang. Uh, I'm from Joseph Cobell School of International Studies at University of Denver uh, and I'm very interested in the cultural communication, uh, China's cultural communication in the U.S. Uh, and I also hold uh, a Chinese conversation table at our school. And uh, um, my question is about Confucius Institutes. As we know, it is a very controversial issue in the international uh, studies. Uh, some people think it provides rich resources for American people to learn uh, Mandarin and Chinese culture. And on the other hand, some people think it's very polit political purpose. China want to like to, uh, uh, to do cultural invasion in the US and also some people even think it's a spy institution. So I want to know uh, what's your uh, opinion in, uh, China, uh, in the Confucius Institutes? Or uh, further, uh, what do you think China's communication strategy in the US? Do you think it is effective? You know, well, the Confucian Institutes, you know, t to teach Americans Chinese is something which I strongly support. You know, it's, 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 you know, I'm not kidding. Zhang Lai Yao Yi Ge Hui Shuo Zhong Wen the Zong Tong. You know, and some of the programs that we're, we're seeing set up are to train Americans in Chinese so that 
you know, here we have 235,000 Chinese students here, and what do we have in China? 20,000? I mean, 20,000? Less than 10 percent. So we're not creating that body of expertise that we need. So Confucian Institutes help that. What they need is more transparency so that the environments, the, the areas in which they exist, people understand how they're operating, you know, what curriculum, you know, are they making decisions which may not be consistent with the universities within which they're operating. But by and large, it's controversial, but by and large it's a, it's a good thing. The communication strategy, you, the problem is some of the things, it's not a communication strategy, it's that there's things that are wrong. There's a perception that all of the problems that Americans experience looking at China are because of a bad communication strategy. That's not true. There are things that go on that no communication strategy is going to help. And that needs to, so some of it is a communication strategy. Some of it is, is stuff that needs to be changed. So no communicate, when we used to run businesses, you know, and we would have these communication consultants in and they would tell us, oh, you can do this, this, and this. And, and I would sit there and say, hey, you know, we're laying off 700 people. I don't know how easy we could, you know, no communication strategy is going to help. we got to lay off 700. There's economies of scale in this business, and that's it. Let's just fa up, face up to it and make some argument. But, you know, there are things that Americans, that the Congress, just are not able to accept, and they're not going to be able to create a communication strategy to solve that. So that, that's the, you know, whether it's dissidents who are put in jail, some of whom we know, whether it's Tibet policy, um, whether it's how, you know, minorities are treated in addition to Tibetans, whether it's, are they bullying the, the Vietnamese and the Filipinos, um, policies on North Korea, that there are things, you can't sugarcoat this. It's not, no, the greatest communication person in the world can't make this better. It's a problem in the policy. So, yes, communication could be a lot better. What I always say, what I always wish for is one day I want the president of China to sit in a chair for an hour and just have a conversation with a famous American anchor so that he can talk directly to the American people without a media filter and he can just explain to them what his life was like growing up, what his China dream is. So not with the media filter but just directly to the American people. And that would help, even though they're not going to agree with him. My view is Americans don't understand what the Chinese of my age have been through. That there is, you know, I always say the war in Vietnam is the defining experience of my life in that I measure so many things against that. But it's tiny compared to the current leadership's experience in the Cultural Revolution. That must define the way they think about things, but they don't explain it. So when they make a decision, which we think, how can you do it? They'll make a decision which to us is a focus on stability that is not rational to an American. They're making a decision that they need to preserve stability at all costs even if it means sacrificing individual rights. American is not going to accept that. But if they could explain directly to the American people how they grew up, how they are growing up, has created this mindset of stability, 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 it would help. At least people would understand. So that's be a communication strategy I would, I would uh, use. We, uh, last question because then we get to eat. Oh, now, see, nobody had their hand up before. Now I got eight hands. Here, we'll take, oh, okay. Ta, 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 okay. Ta, 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 ta
Oh, no, no, here, go ahead. You go. But make it short. Okay, thank you, President, uh, for your uh, wonderful speaking. My question is... Uh, What's your I name and where are you from? Myself a little bit. Uh, I'm also from uh, Corporal International Relations uh, from, at, at the University of Denver. Wow. Yeah. So Denver's dominating. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My question is... Go Broncos! Uh, because when we are talking about the relationship between those two nations, I think like the money issue is probably uh, also an important issue. Like, uh, because the Chinese government right now has a huge U.S. dollar relation, uh, reservation, and also we are still keep buying those United States bonds. Uh, do you think the U.S. going to pay the money back? And, uh, or it's just going to be a forgiven law forever. And also... Will the U.S. pay back its U.S. Treasury obligations? That's an easy one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, another question is, is there an uh, education bubble when Wall Street clapped? Well, well, what we're seeing, though, is, is obviously the returns that you're getting on those treasuries. They will be paid back, but you're getting 1%, 2% return on it, which is, which is much inferior to the return that ACE gets or anybody else gets on their capital. So they will, they will reallocate the portfolio into you know, more direct investment and other equity investments which get a, a higher return. Um, but the trouble is the reserves are building so fast that even if you're reallocating, you're still buying lots more treasuries. All right, I promised this lady right here, last one, then we'll, you can ask at the reception. Right, Jan? Okay. Good evening. My name is Ray, and I'm from Michigan State University. I'm working um, in a public elementary school to teach Chinese in Michigan. And my question I th is closer to education part, because um, I know that Great Britain, um, they are uh, more welcome some Chinese teachers to come to the Great Britain to teach them um, Chinese. So I'm interested that if there will be more supportive for Chinese uh, teachers that, um, like uh, working, involving in, in, in the United States, they have more um, policies of supportive so they can make me feel like, um, um, like my work is stable. Because my Western teacher told me that Japanese um, was very famous about uh, was very famous in in the United States, but now Chinese has become famous. So I think my job is very close to the United United States and Chinese relationship. So if one one time the Chinese uh, and China and United States are becoming intense, like I maybe lose my job. I, I I don't think I don't think you'll lose your job. But look, you know. If you have specific ideas how you can increase the, the education of Americans in Chinese language, you should do it. We have, for 19 years, had a program where we brought Chinese teachers to the United States to teach um, in high schools throughout the country. Um, and we also send teachers of English to China. But it, it's, it's, we need more. Thank you. Thank you all. Now wait.